He's like, what you doing, man? Lee, hey, Lee, what you doing? I was with him in Chicago. I was with Donna Washington, and he was with our Blakey. And that's when I first realized that he had succumbed to, to the drug culture. And um, it was most unfortunate because he was such a rare talent. And I was very disappointed, but then I asked him if I could, if there's anything I could do to help him. And there was nothing I could do at that time. And so when next thing I know, I had been talked about, about, about firing him. Uh, and uh, so next thing I know, he and Bobby Timmons were both, had left the group. There was some concern. What was coming next in his life? that we had no control over. Lee, why don't you do this? Lee, why don't you do this? You know, and we knew that, you know, because when he, when he left, we weren't gonna, gonna see him, you know, like, uh, I mean, we couldn't go home with him. Not all musicians were experimenting with the drugs and everything, I never did. We played at Birdland one time, it's a Monday night, and Lee came with no shoes because he had on some like bedroom slippers and he was trying to make us all be okay with it. You know, like he was like, you yeah, know, what's wrong with you guys, man? Yeah, oh yeah, I got my slippers on, but he had sold his shoes to get some drugs. Heroin, if you know about it, it leaves you really sick and, and a lot of pain if you don't have it. And uh, he said he, he'd rather do that than play the trumpet at the time. He could play the trumpet, wasn't no problem. It's that drugs that he couldn't control. I asked him about once he was lying down, I saw that he had the burn on the side of his head. I asked him about that. He told me readily about that. He'd gotten high and um, kind of um, OD'd and fell, and his head hit the radiator, and he was out, and um, he smelled burning flesh, and the radiator had burned, you know, a big hole. And then if you notice in his pictures after 1965, he combed his hair forward. And it was only when his head was in a certain position, you could, the hair would fall away and you could see the scar, the burn on his head. Lee's sound was in my head since I was like maybe 18. So I just really loved his playing. When I came to New York, it was a different time. And uh, I didn't see Lee Morgan. He wasn't around. Until one day, oddly enough, I was on the subway. And we had come to maybe 125th Street. And the subway stopped. And I happened to look out the window. And I saw this guy. He had, on a, he had on a long overcoat because it was the winter time. And he had his, his head wrapped in like a, a, it was like a scarf or something. And just as the train was moving out of the station, I saw his face. It was Lee Morgan. But he looked like, uh, he looked like a homeless person.
It was a very, very sad time. You know, nobody would hire him. I mean, he really went down as far as you can go. And then, uh, then somehow, uh, you met Helen. You call him Morgan. Yeah. Why do you call him Morgan? He didn't have the name. Uh huh. And uh, I call him Morgan. Morgan was one of the people that would came to my house. And for some kind of reason, I don't know, just seemed like I, my heart went out to him. I said, this, this little boy, you know? I remember it was cold. And he had on this jacket. I said, you ain't got no cold? And I said, what are you doing with that jacket? And I said, child, it's zero degree out there. I said, well, John, you need your coat. I said, where is your coat? He said, I pointed. I said, well, come on, I'm going to go get your coat. Because it's too cold. And he just hung on to me. He had had his teeth knocked out. And he had the brace on. He saved the teeth. And that had been years, and he hadn't even got the brace off. But I said, you don't, you're not playing or nothing? I said, you need to start back to work. Because, see, they couldn't depend on him. They said, Lee Morgan is going to pay at so-and-so and so place. He might not be there. He said, I know. I said, you, well, you can't do that. I thought Helen was super. She was like his confidant. She was his friend, his lover. She was older. And she definitely was unafraid to, to be with a person who was unstable. I don't know much about her background, but whatever it was, it gave her a, a, a strength. She had a real quiet strength about her. And he really trusted her. We got an apartment and we moved from downtown. Morgan went to the hospital in the Bronx, that hospital. Look, they were, they were giving the methadone. The place you had to go in there and stay. And then he turned himself in. He went in. Grand Concourse. About two blocks from Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Uh, but it was, uh, I mean, it was quite a move up, so to speak, from what it was. And uh, when he came out, and that's when I was working, you know, talking to people. Mm -hmm. And then when he came out, they started rehearsing because the people, everybody wanted to, would play with him now. Wasn't no thing about getting you to work. I was uh, coming from a rehearsal with uh, Joe Henderson at Chick Corea's house. I remember that because it was a bakery. His family had a bakery, I believe. And as I came out of the bakery, I was standing on the corner. I looked down and it was Lee Morgan. And he was standing there. <laughs> so we got into conversation. And uh, I hadn't seen him in quite a while. And uh, 
considering what he had gone through, I was amazed that he was able to hold together at all, you know. He uh, informed me he was starting a new group. And uh, would I like to be in it? Sure, we got together at a place called Slugs. He had never come to a job without her. We did the contract with her, you know? It was like she was managing him. I did always uh, uh, work out, you know, when is he coming in? Well, he can come in so and so time. Okay, let's make it this time. This was always with her. She carried his trumpet case, you know? She did everything for him. He played a lot, you know? He started dressing. He liked to wear his white shirt, shirt, tie, leather, jacket, shoes shine. Yeah, he liked to be clean now. He liked to be clean. And then one his shirts and now you want me to iron his shirt. And do all that. But he wrote this tune for me called Helen's Ritual. I put lotion and thing on. <laughs> and said, well, they get ready to go somewhere. It take me a half hour. Because I got to go through that ritual, that lotion. Every day when we were going out, I remember we were going, whatever, that lotion. Helen's Ritual. I didn't meet him until after they had a relationship going good. And, uh, shoot, I said, shoot, he's, me and him about the same age. I said, Miss Helen. <laughs> All right, and uh, I would say they needed each other at the time that she met him. She had someone to take care of, and he had someone to take care of her, and it seemed to be a, a good thing. gentlemen, my name is Lee Morgan. For those of you who might have just come in, the reason for all these microphones is that we're recording live for Blue Note Records. Lee Morgan Quintet live at Hermosa Beach, the lighthouse. Now here's Absolution. We were enjoying it. You know, we really enjoyed it because it gave us a chance, first of all, to be away for a month from New York because we're here by the ocean. What I remember, one thing, Lee practiced every day. Yeah. He would make me feel like, well, maybe I should practice too. <laughs> he was enjoying not wearing any shoes and been walking in the sand in his bare feet, you know. <laughs> How can you not be relaxed? This was a great place to relax. Right now, just me and my wife, so uh, a lot of times, uh, I would say at least half of the time, I'll take her with me, you know? And she serves as wife, cook, uh, secretary, uh, mm, everything no else, you know, besides a nice vacation for her, you yeah. know, as well. I could understand Helen's position. I mean, she wanted to be in that world, and he was the key. And uh, traveling up on down the West Coast and rubbing elbows with the end crowd. 
She uh, always did all the arrangements for the traveling. And you see this big hat come in the door and you knew no it was Helen. That was a good part of his life, I'm sure. I mean, they really, they, they cared about each other. They loved each other. I would see them sometimes, they'd be walking, holding hands, you know, laughing about something, you know. Lee was always making her laugh. And I think that's, that's one thing she liked a lot, you know. I met Miles, nasty, nasty, you know. I met him, he said hello, I said hello. He said, then who are you supposed to be? I said, I am not supposed to be, I am Hella Morgan. He said, oh, you Lee Morgan's woman? I said, yes. He said, well, I guess you know who I am. And I said, I don't have to know who you are. And he laughed, you know. He said, I see you got a quick mouth. And the words he said to me like this, I don't mess too much around with bitches with quick mouths. And I said, well, I don't consider myself that. She was the entertainment's wife, you know. It was her thing, so it seemed to be working good, as far as I could see. And uh, more power to her. Um, are you still with Lee? She said, of course. She said, yeah, I got him back on his feet and we're doing this and they're doing Then I saw a different Helen. It wasn't the Helen that I grew up with. It was a woman who cared, who almost had adopted a child because Lee and her were quite different in age. And I was very proud of her. I was proud of her when I knew her as a, as a young man. But as a man, I became even more proud of her, okay? Because she was helping someone get back on their feet who had a lot of talent. His life was restored by Helen, and uh, it was joy to watch. He had his own group, he was playing, he was producing, and uh, he was living. We would get together sometimes at his apartment, at their apartment actually. Lee would call me, he said, well, why don't you come over and we have dinner? So I said, okay. This apartment they had was beautiful. It was immaculate. Helen took care of the house. You know, she would fix us a nice dinner. We would sit down and have dinner. And then uh, after dinner, Lee would, uh, you know, want to go out. Because he liked to go out and hear other musicians. So we would leave. Helen would say, no, I'm not going with you guys because you're going to be out too late. I just want to stay here. It would be good to get him out of here so I could be here by myself. Oh, she was like, take him away, <laughs> that kind of thing. So he said, well, I'll be back. But it was always fun. And so during that time, I said, what Lee needs now is not only the support that he gets from his home, from Helen, but he needs to be put in with a group of young people who are aspiring to be like him artistically. And so I brought him in to Jasper Bill Workshop. Uh, we teach anybody who wants it. It's mostly designed for youngsters, but anybody who wants to come. It's not really a teaching. We've had uh, like arrangements 
for big bands, small bands, and whatnot. And these are donated by, say, like Fad or uh, Benny Golson or Oliver Nelson, mm -hmm. Shorter, you know, our top yeah. writers. Yeah. And they get a chance to play. Yeah. Some of the more talented ones uh, are trying to write themselves, and we kind of evaluate their things, you know. I notice a lot of times I'm talking to them, and, I, and I'll say something or mention uh, something that might have happened in the 50s or something, talking about Clifford Brown. Or, mm. And he'll be looking at me with a puzzled look, and I re realize that here I'm talking to a kid that's only 15 years old, you know. Mm. To him, I'm ancient. Yeah. You see right. what I'm trying to say, you know? These young kids, they loved him, and they were soaking up all that he had to offer. And he wanted to give and give and give and give. I find that the essence of creativity is, is the newness of things. And the only way to keep things new is to have constant changes in environment and surroundings and people and whatnot. Yeah. You know? And that's the thing that is so exciting about uh, being a jazz musician. That's the fun, that's what I saw a lot of. That's the fun stuff. Fooling around. But I like that one. I met Lee Morgan in the late 1950s in Atlantic City, New Jersey, when um, my family was working down there in the different clubs and the cabaret clubs, way preceding the casinos. And Lee Morgan was at uh, the Cotton Club with the Cookers, his own group. When we hung out, we'd go to the movies, we'd get popcorn, we'd spill it. He'd laugh just like a kid. And I liked it because he was so down to earth. He called himself Howdy Doody. That was a private joke we had between us because he had big ears like Howdy Doody, which was a, a doll clown years ago. And so he says, I'm Howdy Doody, and he called me Baby Huey because I had kind of a big butt. He says, let's go to uh, Blue Note and let's pick out some albums and we just listen to them. And at the time, in my car, I had an eight track in my car. That's as big as a VHS now, you know, this big thing and clunk, you put it in your car. And we would ride around listening to music, go down by the West Side Highway under the George Washington Bridge and listen to music. Nothing fancy, just hang out. That's just what we did. either at the train or at the Grand Conference, not going back to New Jersey. You started seeing this girl. You know what I mean? Once he was, got himself straight, they warned him. And then they were hanging out. She was, she, you know, he had somebody to. I saw her hanging around. And uh, I'd go in the bathroom and they would be in it, you know. I got a call from Helen. And Helen was looking for Lee. And Lee never stayed out all night, never. Generally, when, when he was out, he was out with Helen. Or he was out with me. It would be like that. And so she says, I'm really concerned about him because he didn't come home last night. And he didn't call me. So I don't, I don't know what to think. 
you know, is he if he's heard or, you know, what's happening? Have you seen him? And I and I told her, no, I haven't seen him. So later in the day, Lee called me. I told him that Helena called me. He says, yeah, I know. She was calling everybody. And he said, I met this woman, and there's a vibe between this woman and I, and I went to her house, and I did not go home. So I was like, wow. Thirty-three. Well, then you're still very young, man. You've been around for for years. Right. Right. It's I started really with Dizzy at eighteen. Yeah. So that means um, what? It's the last fifteen years. Mm. And it's like a lifetime for some people. Mm. -hmm. Between Christmas and New Year's, when the year 1972 came in, we were hanging out in Jersey, going to the local bar. He was shooting pool with my friends. Um, he just wanted to be in New Jersey, go to the diner that stayed open on the East Orange Diner from East Orange, New Jersey. Um, go to the diner, you know. And um, on New Year's Eve, um, we were at my house. No hanging out, no gigging, no party, no nothing. And we just crashed watching the fish tank. I had a 100-gallon long fish tank for my children. Fish tank was like the center of attraction in, in my house because it was, the fish were really cool. And he would sit there mesmerized watching the fish. He said, I'm not composing anymore. I never bothered him. I was just wanting him to just search his own soul and feel good about it. Because of the addiction and whatnot, his Sexuality was very, 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 very limited, almost non-existent because of what he had been through. It didn't faze me because we were good friends. And that New Year's Eve, we, he woke me up like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, which was then 1972, had come in. And he said, something drastic is getting ready to happen. He said, I can feel it. I heard from Lee that we were supposed to do a uh, television recording on this, a show called Soul. This show featured uh, jazz acts, jazz performances, and the audience was uh, a lot of young black listeners who, who were in, really into jazz. So this was a good one. This was a good show, a good, uh, good event to, to participate in. Good evening. I'm your announcer, Jerry V, and tonight on Soul, Trumpet star Lee Morgan, Harold Mayburn, Jimmy Merritt, Freddie Waits, Billy Harper. Yeah, it was, it was a nice set. And it was good to, to have the opportunity to, to, you know, be on television at that time. Here is brother Lee Morgan and the quintet. Now we'd like to do a brand new one. This is composed by bassist Jimmy Merritt and is dedicated to Sister Angela Davis. The title, Angela. We recorded a tune called Angela which was uh, something that Lee had asked me to write for, you know, write something for him. And that seemed to be something that needed to be addressed at that time. You know, 
don't, I don't believe in labels, mm -hmm. uh, music period. I don't even like the word jazz, really. I think it's a, a bad word. It's not a word that we made up. It's a word that we were told what it was. It's like we were told that we are Negroes or, you know, uh, same kind of thing. Uh, if you ask me what could I, uh, what would I call our music, you know, the best thing I could come up with would probably be black uh, classical music. You know, you know. Mm. Uh, but then that's even a broad term, you know. He did a television show, naturally I was there. But that didn't mean nothing. Because when we left, he was going on to her. And I was going on to, you know. What you doing? I said, I'm not one of those women that can talk about I'm the main woman and you got somebody else out there. I said, I'm not built that way. That's not me. I I am never, no, no, I, I am no main woman. If you leaving me here every night by myself and you out there with somebody, I'm not the man. I don't forget, I told him I was, I had some friends in Chicago and I was going to visit them. And I told him, I said, I'm going to Chicago. I don't know when I'll be back. I said, because I feel like something bad is going to happen out of this. And that Sunday, he begged me not to go. He said, oh, no, no, don't go. Don't go to Chicago, he said. I said, but we can't live, I can't live like this. I said, it's not in me. And I didn't go to Chicago. And I told him, I said, you know, Morgan, I'm making the biggest mistake of my life.